of the Auto Mechanica Dubai. Uh, this is our 17th edition and we are happy to have all of your presence at the exhibition and the conference today. We had uh, quite some interesting discussions for the past two days and today uh, in our final uh, day of the academy we do have uh, the best lined up. Uh, in the morning we will be having sessions by Chikani. Uh, we will have uh, two speakers, come trainers from Chikani who will be um, talking to us and uh, sharing some insights around standardization with us. Uh, to start on with, on our first session uh, we have Mr. Khalid al of partner Tikani, who will be talking about the benefits of training staff to a recognized standard. With political, social and economic pressures stipulating the need to create and develop local automotive experts, international standards provide guidance for the required recruiting and development programs. Khalid will provide an overview of choices available the competencies, uh, competencies needed to work on modern cars are basically identical all over the world. Therefore, the fashion in which team members are assessed should be similarly based on those required competencies. Khalid will then go over the advantages international standards have in light of recruitment cost, onboarding, and the timeline by which a new team member is fully productive considering local and international recruitment weighing the quality of graduates versus the quantity of graduates needed to comply with localization will conclude the session. May I welcome Khalid on stage. Mr. Khalid al -Vasiya, can we welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I said, I'm working for Tikani. We are um, a local training and development company which is focusing on the automotive market. We are covering from the frontline staff, technicians, all the way to managers and senior managers with different uh, options we are offering. Uh, we are all uh, globally certified, many times by different manufacturers and other organizations. Our uh, offerings include executive coaching for, uh, for Marshall Goldsmiths, uh, talent assessments, which we use for uh, offering clients uh, training programs, which are uh, particularly fitted to their customers, as well as technical e-learning solutions. We have offices in uh, Dubai and Saudi Arabia. And we cover the whole Middle East, India, uh, Africa, and parts of Asia. Training standards. If you have a quick look at this one here, uh, we can teach a dog to whistle, it does not mean that he actually learned how to whistle. So we really have to see how our teaching of the learning has progressed over this. If we look on the political and social pressures at the moment, particularly in Saudi Arabia, we are going to be focusing on, but as well in the Middle East, yeah, you can see here the enrollment for in uh, vocational education programs across the region. In Saudi Arabia, only 8% of high school graduates enter a vocational program. Kuwait 3, Egypt as much as 37, Turkey 35, and Tunisia is 15. Qatar, less than 1%. So there is a lot of potential here to bring vocational training into the mainstream in the region. Um, corporate uh, social responsibility is becoming a much more important issue. The companies, dealerships and manufacturers are seen to give back into society to provide jobs for um, how can I say this? academically not so bright students, which may, uh, for uh, family backgrounds and others have not been achieving as much as they could. Uh, improving uh, use of employment. A lot of research has been done on this, and Hoasek in 2017 has shown that the advantage from a vocational training program can last up to the age of 65, which is basically retirement age. And if we compare traditional academic training, university, with uh, 
vocational training, there's actually an ratio of 1.6 where it's more likely that you will be continuously employed during your lifespan. There's a lot of academics which have no work. As well, there is a significant academic proof that the shift from being in high school into being a productive member of society is far easier if you have vocational training than it is traditional university training, even if it extends to master or a PhD levels. I mean, in Germany, for example, there are quite a lot of taxi drivers which hold PhD degrees, which I think is a bit useless then. Yeah, I'm being at the university for, I don't know what, a better part of 10 years and then driving taxi. You could have saved, uh, saved the time and money for that. Yeah. Yes, that will improve the uh, uh, quality of the conversation with the taxi driver. That's quite right. Yeah. But if, if you look like uh, effort, outcome, uh, I don't know if your kids will be uh, happy if you're the taxi driver on that. Yeah. Um, another thing, why we have this result in the region, is the cultural stigma connected with uh, vocational training. In the GCC, vocational training is, uh, or the jobs which are coming out of vocational training, is connected traditionally with imported labor out of the Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. So it is not really desirable as a career to join this. Over the last five, six years this has shifted somewhat, particularly in Saudi Arabia, because uh, the government has really, really forced more people to go into that, uh, where the TVTC uh, campaigns in Saudi Arabia and other countries, but still it is not desirable a career. If you compare this, for example, to the UK, South Africa or Germany, and you look at the high school uh, graduates which go in automotive training in the UK and Germany, it is the top 10%. It's the same people which have the qualifications to go to university, go into automotive, uh, automotive mechanic uh, programs. In the Middle East, that is shifted. It is not the top 10%, it is actually the lower percentage brackets which go into uh, to these programs. It's the ones which could not go to university, could not get into colleges, or in other uh, development programs. It's basically the second, third, sometimes even fourth choice. Yeah? So right from the beginning, the uh, entry level competencies, the qualifications, are far lower than they are in uh, other markets. Yeah? Minimum wage rises in Saudi Arabia, entry level is about four and a half thousand Saudi real at the moment for an automatic uh, automotive trans, uh, technician. This is not where you really see the career going on. Uh, uh, the expectations are far, 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 far higher than uh, what the industry is able to pay. The one thing which has been happening in Saudi Arabia is that in order to try to attract into, uh, not government uh, programs, but into uh, company programs, is to offer a career rather than a job. Uh, what we did uh, with Jago Land Rover in Saudi Arabia is that we offered them an apprenticeship uh, program, but in all the advertisement, we actually showed already the progression line up to master technician levels, and we actually included the salary packages and wage packages on that level. So they can, could see, for example, that okay, today I'm getting uh, three, four thousand reals, but if I work and develop myself over the next few years, I have a chance to get onto the Jekyll and Rover certification program, and then within that, progress to master level and actually have a chance to become a service manager at the end. Where really then in, in 10, 15 years time, I have no issues on the financially supporting my family. Visa restrictions and costs are a huge impact at the moment. Uh, I had recently a discussion with a company owner who told me in Saudi Arabia the visa cost for one of the staff members was 600 reals per year. 
Now it's 6,000. Yeah? And that trend is going to continue. The government is making it more, um, making it less attractive to hire foreigners in comparison to hire local loos. And that is a trend which is expanding from Saudi Arabia into the other GCC markets as well. Yeah? Um, and of course, it is not as easy anymore to get uh, 50 visas if you need them. If you apply for 50 visas, you may uh, get uh, 10, 15, depending on your uh, classification in the Saudization, Saudization uh, criteria market. If you are uh, either in the green level, where everything is fine, or in the yellow level, where you're just about okay, or if you are in the danger zone, which is the marked red. Uh, and uh, there are new systems and new KPIs for the shoes coming out continuously. In the past it was that it was measured on the complete company, how much localization you have. Now it's uh, by department, now it's by branch, and very soon they're going to be introduced actually by job role. Uh, so they're going to be restricting the ability of hiring foreigners uh, as imported labor more and more and more. Yeah. So, the pressure to really do something on the vocational side is really increasing. Yeah. If you look here, over the years from 1985 uh, to 2013, uh, Middle East and Northern Africa, in all the Calvin, the there has been really no change in the amount of people in, in vocational training. And that is actually the worrying element. Yeah. With all the uh, birth rates now coming into school, I mean, in the Middle East, the population is 60% uh, is less than 30 years old. Uh, there, there are not enough jobs there, and, and taking out all the vocational op uh, opportunities uh, is really, really worrying on a long term uh, element. Uh, talking about apprenticeships and uh, the return on investment for a company. This is some data from the Institute of Motor Industry in the UK. Uh, and if you look at the program cost for an apprenticeship program, an in-house apprenticeship program, if you set this aside and uh, appreciate over a couple of years on the financial side, uh, in the JLR program, each technician, uh, each apprentice which sold one additional hour, either by himself or by making his lead technician more efficient, that actually paid for the apprentice's wages in the months. Yeah? And that is actually something which a lot of service managers did not realize. They were all saying, here, it's going to cost me money, 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 money. Yeah, it's nothing in for me. But it only takes one hour additional sales per, per, per apprentice to cover his wage. Uh, so there is really no reason on this. Operational costs are then covered by any additional service hours. I mean, think about it. If you have a service technician, and you have an apprentice, and he just removes the tires and wheels, cleans them up, and puts them back for any inspection. Over a day, three times, that's one hour saved for the main technician. Uh, where he can do the other stuff, more uh, profitable repairs. Yeah? And can see here as well, at quarter seven, the company actually is going to make profit on an apprentice. Uh, yes, in the beginning, there are here co uh, costs. It's definitely negative. Uh, but as of quarter seven, it's really where the employer benefits from an apprenticeship program. If you look now at uh, apprenticeship programs, in the world there are different types. There's full-time study, like for example in Saudi Arabia, the TVTC, which is a two-year college degree. You know? And you have, like in the UK, you have open-ended uh, programs, which are not time-specific. You do an apprenticeship, and then basically the company decides this is a one-year apprenticeship, a two-year apprenticeship, or up to five-year apprenticeships. Then you can have as well connections either with uh, City and Guilds or the IMI to get different outcome qualifications. But in the UK, that is not regulated. 
In Germany, for example, uh, it is regulated to a three or three and a half year apprenticeship. It is time limited. In that period, you have to graduate that person. The difference between the programs is that if you have a government-run, college-based program, this is very, very similar to traditional education. The way the facilities are set up, the way the curriculum is designed, the way uh, teachers present the uh, information. So the people which enroll in this one, uh, we have to think about again, if these are not people which are not successful in traditional education, and then they move into a vocational program, which is still using the same principles, so we are again not getting their full potential. If we compare that to uh, in-company programs, the advantage here is that the skills passed on are much more directly applicable in the job they're going to do later on. Because the company is going to teach them on the job what they're actually normally doing. Yeah? So there is uh, no disconnect between what they learn in, in a two-year college program. Okay, they, uh, they learn their things. Yeah? But then if you are in the, in the workshop, it may be totally different how it is applied. So uh, the job satisfaction from apprentices in, uh, in, in, in company programs is far higher than when it comes from a college-based program. And if you look at uh, places like Saudi Arabia and the GCC, you can see as well that the graduates from TVTC programs, the TVTC, uh, the two year programs, they have problems finding jobs later on. Traditionally, they go into the government jobs where there is uh, non really high performance pressures, but in the private industry, they're not really that successful. Whereas, uh, like in the Nagi Group or with Al Jafari, where they had in Toyota, where they had in company programs, people actually stayed with the organization and progressed uh, through the hierarchy. Um, if you take Mazda, for example, they have now in Saudi Arabia two workshops where the complete staff from technicians, service advisors, uh, service managers is completely in house grown. They were taken as high school graduates and then over the last, I think, 14 years now, yeah, they developed the right people to progress. Yeah. So it is possible in the, uh, this region as well. If you get the right people and you get the right commitment from the companies. Yeah. International standards. What is here very important is outcome expectations. Yeah? Here you see us, uh, the me with uh, the IMI representative and uh, somebody from the Nottingham College in the UK. Our program was set up in a way that we, we looked first on what do we want? Do we want fully qualified technicians? And we said no, because Jago Land Rover has already an in-house accreditation program. We don't need to copy this, we don't need to duplicate this. What we wanted was we wanted people which can enter the Jago Land Rover program and succeed. Yeah? So the goal to the outcome is very, very important where you set this. And we set this out from level in UK level one, yeah? that they can basically have the basic automotive understanding and then join the Jago Land Rover program to become level 2 and level 3 certified. If you set the outcome expectations, what is very important as well that you include the student. Because if they have expectations that they become service managers, that they become uh, office people, then this is not the right approach. You get, you're not attracting the right people. We need people which are actually happy of working with the tools on the car. Outcome expectations is as well important for the parents. In our recruitment drive, more than 60% of the enrollment were actually pushed towards us by the parents, not the young person themselves. So when you do your advertisement, 
when you do your uh, career planning, yeah, when you put the salary structures up to master level, you actually need to address parents as much as the young uh, kids. Yeah? And as well, this is why we, when, when we uh, did this, we did this via two channels. We uh, did this on Facebook via the uh, uh, connected to football page, which was like seen by the youth to attract them. But we used as well radio stations in Saudi Arabia. Yeah? Non nobody from the youth is listening to radios, but their parents, their fathers, their uncles were listening to it. Yeah? What we had quite often is that an uncle grabbed his uh, underachieving, in his eyes, underachieving uh, nephew and tracked him uh, to our uh, events where we uh, provided information and enrolled people. Yeah. Here, outdoor expectations is really, really important. Recognition of certification. When we started to set up with Jagal and Tour the program, we were looking at it, what is going to sell our program to the public? Yeah. How we can get parents and youth to really say, yes, that is something for me, that is something I can invest my time in. Yeah. Uh, local government certifications were available in Saudi Arabia for the last 40 years. They didn't attract enough people and didn't attract the right people. Yeah. So that by itself was not enough. So we were looking at what else is there in the market. And we looked at uh, German, Japanese, American, Canadian, South African, and of course uh, UK qualifications. The highest recognition was actually the IMI, in part of people knowing it, and it was uh, to the element that the local uh, government agents have known about IMI. We actually found out that the IMI, for many years, was to, uh, doing support work for the local automotive colleges. Yeah? So there was high recognition and acceptance. Yeah? So they were saying, if the program is accepted by IMI, who are we to say no? Of course we accept that. Yeah? If you look around the region, and we're talking here eight, nine years ago, there were still a lot of uh, British uh, managers and people which worked under British managers. Yeah? So the IMI again was very well known. It was high acceptance in the workplace as well by the people which decided on the money amounts. When you talk to parents, and you say he gets a, a local certification, that is one thing. But if you add on then an international certification, uh, that raises the value of the program again. So that is really important. Now, the reason we chose IMI is because as well the manufacturer, Jago Landrov in our case, is working with the IMI together. Uh, because we wanted support uh, coins from the regional office as well as the home office in the UK. Uh, so if I come to them with a certification program they don't know nothing about, then it's very difficult to open uh, their pockets. Our program at the same time started with Jagger Land Rover and BMW. The way B uh, BMW received our proposals was totally different than Jagger Land Rover. Why? The Germans don't know IMI. Yeah? So, if you work with a Japanese company, don't use IMI, use something Japanese. There has to be recognition for this, because uh, Jagger Land Rover provided us with two containers full of equipment, engine, uh, research vehicles and all stuff. If you want that to serve your, your college, you need their buy-in. Yeah? So recognition here is really, really important. Entry-level competencies. That is something which is really, very important. When we started our program in the first week, we actually got shocked. Uh, something, something happened which we didn't expect. And that is that people did not know how to use a screwdriver. Uh, there were some guys which really poked their eyes out. Now, when I was 13, and I started taking the iron from my uh, mom apart, and she was screaming and shouting at me, the fridge got uh, put into pieces. Yeah, I have known how to use basic tools, a hammer. All those skills were non-existent. And we had to scramble, get to a wood shop, get some uh, two by fours, some screws, and teach them for a day how to use a screwdriver in the easiest way. So, entry-level qualifications is very, very important. 
Now, if you remember earlier, I said the high school graduates we are getting into the programs are of the lower uh, success rates. But that means as well their math and their science knowledge is lower. But without math and science, it's very difficult to succeed in an automotive program. So when you set up your program and you consider this, you need to think about how you can raise that a bit. Yeah? And include this in your, in your curriculum that this needs to be covered. Yeah? We had quite some issues with trainer competences. Yeah? And this is why you see our friend here from the Nottingham College. We get them for two weeks. The first week was to uh, have our team trained up on the UK teacher qualification, so they know the basics, how to uh, present information in a college environment, but as well how to document it in a standardized way, because IMI, Jago Land Rover, the government would be coming to do audits later on. So it's not just enough to, to train and get people good, but you have to document this as well. So if somebody comes and asks, how do you have spent our money? Yeah? You have to have uh, good documentation on this. And it has to be uh, sustainable and to the same level across all trainers. The other thing what we had to do in a week's training was to give them the IMI assessor qualification. Because it's not only enough to just train people, you need to then as well have a standardized approach on how to assess, have these people digested what they need to. Uh -huh. Now, that was actually for us a great opportunity as well to get buy-in into the workshops. Because the problem there was you had 20 uh, foreigners, which were senior technicians, which were then tasked with apprentices, please train him. The simple situation is, the general was thinking, you are asking me to train somebody who is going to take my job? Where are you coming from? No? So you actually had to provide some incentive for those guys to do something. No? And the trainer and the assessor qualifications were a perfect first thing there. No? Because you actually showed them, look, we are developing you, we are having trust in you. And you will grow with us because this program is only going to grow. Uh, so you actually gave something they could take back home or into the next job within the region or outside the region. Uh, so trainer competences is not just the guys in your program, it's as well in the workshop. Because IMI assessments is in the classroom, pretty much academically, uh, multiple choice paper, uh, simulations in the, in the workshop, from the college, uh, practical things, observations, how they do this, project assignments, but as well, the team leaders and the workshop managers in the workshop have a responsibility and are encouraged to witness and verify, yes, they have done this job. Huh? Because then they get this the feeling, these are my guys, this is people I have developed. So we have to stay in the back. Huh? Um, and then, when you get this uh, situation, like in the UK or in Germany, where the older guys are proud to actually have grown up the next generation, then you get uh, knowledge recycling and development, which is really necessary for these uh, programs. Another thing is process documentation. You have people who speak English, those people who speak Arabic and require Arabic from the government support, from the government accreditation bodies. And if you have people which come from high school, but you have the lower success bracket, the English language is going to be handicapped as well. So in the first six months, your training documentation, the training material, has to support this language barrier. No? We had two hours of language training every single day for the apprentices for 18 months. No? And only after six months in the program, we went to 100% English tuition. No? So, focus documentation has to be in English and has to be in Arabic as well. Because if you give the student a focus document, this is what you have to do, this is how you process it, and he does not understand it, 
again, the success rate will be not so good. So you have to, uh, at least in the first six months, go bilingual. Huh? Internal, external quality control are issues. We had uh, external quality control. We had every six months somebody from the IMI coming and see our processes. We had first, uh, as a whole college, we had to get approved. Same way it was in the UK, the same qualifications and the considerations we had to fulfill. We had an internal uh, 